All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Off Axis Podcast. I'm here with CR or Charles Barber. Charles, Charles Ryan. Or, yeah. Let's, Charles Ryan. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> How are you doing today? Doing well. How about you? Pretty good. So you're an acrobat. You are recently moving to Vegas, correct? Sort of. I, I, I do still live in LA, but um, I've got a house in Vegas and I go back and forth for training. Awesome. And you are doing acrobatics with one leg now. Yes, I have one leg now. That's a very tough feat to accomplish, I bet. And feet. Uh, I, oh God, <laughs> that was that was totally on accident. I'm like extra primed for all the foot jokes now. It's uh, yeah, yeah, I bet. So, what did you grow up doing? Um, I was that kid that was just jumping off of like the tallest thing in the playground that he could find. I was doing backflips out of the swing before I could remember. Like, I just loved flying through the air, flipping jumping, running, all that stuff, tumbling, whatever I could figure out how to do. Yeah. And then, uh, you got into circus acrobatics and that kind of stuff, right? Much later though. Much uh, later. I grew up just playing like normal sports. Uh, and I was never very good at like team sports. I, I would try, um, and like physically I was good, but, uh, I just, I couldn't wrap my mind around like where I needed to be on the field. It always seemed to be like the wrong place. So, um, uh, I never really thought that I was all that athletic. I just knew that I liked to flip and stuff, but, um, only like very late twenties, early thirties. Did I start getting into like circ level acrobatic stuff? Okay. So how old are you now? 37, 37. Yeah. Sweet. So, so you did like uh diving, you said, right? Yeah, I did dive, uh, but like not in high in school. Like, oh, in high school, not on a team though. That's the thing. I never had like, um, I never had a team to even join and, uh, but I just got on whatever diving boards or trampolines or mats that I could find. Basically. I, I remember going to the cheerleading gym when I was in college again, just for fun, but bouncing on the trampoline and kind of just self-taught my brother and I, um, especially we got a trampoline in the backyard and we, whatever one brother did, the other one had to like do and then like see if it could add a twist. We were doing actually some pretty like advanced stuff looking back, but we didn't know any of the like save yourself, you know, fundamental basics. So I can't believe we didn't get more hurt than we did. Yeah. (laughs) We were each doing like triple full backflips on the trampoline without even knowing like what that was. Yeah. I, I was doing the exact same stuff. No knowledge of what I was doing or anything. I just knew that if people double bounced me, I went higher and then I just tried to do as many spins as I possibly could and somehow never really flew off the trampoline. Um, but I never really got into like acrobatics and that kind of stuff until I was 26 or so. I did like skate park stuff growing up, but never circus acrobatics at all. Um, so yeah. And I also didn't have like a pool that I was able to join. Otherwise I totally would have been on the diving team, but diving is so fun. Um, So fun. Yeah. Yeah. So when you did get into acrobatics, what was like the, the things that stood out that you enjoyed doing? The, well, skills. Like, I mean, I taught myself a standing backflip and I could walk around on my hands for a little bit, like from high school on, but I really got serious about it when I moved to LA and I found muscle beach, um, Santa Monica, original muscle beach. And, uh, I started doing flying rings there, uh, and traveling rings and acro and, uh, and stuff like that. But flying rings were by far my favorite and I had a blast learning those. It was really, really fun. Nice. And where are you from originally? Uh, kind of all over the East coast. Um, Philadelphia till I was nine, Cincinnati till halfway through high school, and then an island off the coast of Georgia through high school and college. Sweet. So what brought you out to LA? I just, I just kind of always knew that I would want to go to California for some reason. Like I remember growing up, friends were like, you're like, man, you seem like you're from California or something like that. And I'd never been there, but I'd just always been drawn to it. And then, uh, in 2010, I visited for the first time and just fell in love with it. Of course, like it was just such a cool city. And, uh, so when I finished college and I was, I was, you know, starting my career as a professional photographer, I decided, Hey, if I can make it in LA, I could make it anywhere. And, uh, that is true. Wanted to try to just, it was kind of like the challenge to myself. Like, can I make it in, you know, the crazy, 
LA scenario uh, as a freelance photographer. And I was also drawn by the idea of road tripping across the United States on my motorcycle, which I did. And it was fantastic. Really? How so long I, did that take? It took like a month. Yeah. I was going to say I had like storm after storm roll in and I had to like hole up at different places, but I visited a bunch of friends and family along the way and took a whole bunch of pictures and it was, it was great. Ended up in LA and, and just had what I could fit on my motorcycle with me. And it was like the perfect, like trial by fire start out in LA. Nice. I had no plans, no nothing. So yeah, I love driving across the country. Uh, what route did you take? Do you I took remember? the 10 for that one. Yeah. Ooh, the 10. Yeah. That one's, uh, With a couple detours to see friends. That one's not too bad. Like the 40 is pretty boring. If you've ever taken the 40 across. There's pretty much nothing. Yeah, I did that ten, recently. At least you're along the beach on some points. But uh, I love doing the 70 to the 80. It goes up across the top. Haven't done that one yet. I would like to. By far the best one. Um, from Denver to here. But after from Denver to like Ohio, there's cornfield. That's about it. So I wouldn't recommend going out of your way to do that drive. It'd be a fun route to Denver, though. I love Colorado. Yeah, and then uh, from, like, I would say, like, uh, Sandusky, Ohio, all the way to New York on that. I think it's 80 or something through there in the Pennsylvania area. is crazy with the mountains and that stuff. Very nice. Yeah, but on a motorcycle, that would be crazy. Because <laughs> you can only do, like, what, three hours a day or something? Uh, it depends. If you pace yourself, it's better if you take you know, breaks. um at smaller intervals, you know, so like, you know, ride for an hour, break for 15 minutes to half an hour. Um, I used to go up to like San Francisco and back quite often from LA and I'd do that in half a day. Oh, wow. Uh, up and back. Yeah. On a sport bike. <laughs> oh my, that's like, <laughs> what, I'm, a, I'm a little crazy. 10 hours. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's quite a bit. Yeah. So do you listen to music or yeah, like sometimes yeah. or, or audio books while you're driving a motorcycle? Well, you know, carefully. <laughs> Only on, like, the highways, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's crazy. I've always tried to stay away from motorcycles because I know that I have an adrenaline addiction and I don't want it to be based on how far I pull the throttle or something, you know? I enjoy cliff diving too much to want to get on a motorcycle. I love cliff diving as well. And I don't know. If you have the discipline, it's worth it. Still, yeah. You can still, you know, get a, a fun rush without, you know doing anything too dangerous but um yeah you definitely have to have to have discipline have to have control of your machine mastery yeah. all of that you know yeah for sure so you were in a motorcycle accident it wasn't really your fault not at all in yeah, fact, yeah so i did everything i could um, even as safe as you are on a motorcycle and in fact you told me this the motorcycle is actually probably the reason why you're still alive honestly in this particular case yeah in most cases you'd rather be in a car than a motorcycle for but sure there are some there are some times where it's actually better and this was one of them yeah so walk me through what happened and how it all went down so i was i just left my parents um house in a little town called prescott arizona it's a little bit uh it's about two hours north of phoenix and um it was Christmas, so we had had an early Christmas, so I was actually leaving Christmas Day. But you were living know. in L.A. at the time, right? I was I was moving, yeah, I was actually moving back to L.A. from Phoenix. Um, I'd had an apartment in Phoenix for about a year, um, but even then I was always back and forth to L.A. I've always been kind of nomadic, so I actually had all my stuff um, with me for my move back to L.A., and I was going back through Phoenix on the way. Um, I was going to stay at a friend's house that night. So yeah, it was, it was like that evening of Christmas and, uh, said, said goodbye to my mom and dad, you know, had my Christmas presents and all my stuff for LA and I took off and, uh, it was about 15 minutes out. Didn't, didn't get, uh, any farther than the other side of town. And, uh, a DUI driver was coming in the opposite direction on the highway and there was no divider. And he was road raging with some other guy and they clipped each other and he lost control and spun across the, uh, all of the lanes into oncoming traffic, which was just me. So it's on a highway with about how many road or how many lanes on each side? It was like five oh, plus a turn lane. Big lane. So 
big highway and it was there was a bit of a curve to it but it was still no center divider no it was uh just like a suicide lane in, in yeah between the the yellow one so <clears throat> it was like right out in front of a lowe's and there was a church and like a coke plant right there so kind of industrial area yeah um, but yeah um from my perspective there was nobody in front of me nobody behind i was just cruising I wasn't speeding or anything, just like normal cruise speed, trying to get to Phoenix safely. And, uh, and I just out of nowhere with no warning, I saw a car, what looked like they were turning left at an impossible speed and angle right in front of me. So it was just like, there was no time to react. I, I remember every detail. I still remember I, I knew it was a Porsche before it even hit me. I was like, Oh, that's a nice Porsche. That is a bad trajectory. And yeah. then, and then it hit and um do you have any idea how fast they were going fast all like the over witnesses 100 probably. Said, i don't know if over 100 but definitely like it was a 45 mile an hour um road and they were way speeding so maybe mm-hmm. 80 maybe 100 i don't know but fast enough and uh i i remember seeing the front of the hood as i as i went over i went up in the air and and did like a front flip and landed in the in the road down quite a ways actually the car ended up way further back but he plowed into the embankment and his car was completely totaled yeah um so if you're in a car you're totally dead probably uh if i yeah if i if i'd been in a car it would have been a head-on uh yep. and going real fast we'd probably both be dead honestly so yeah as it was the car hit my leg directly um and whatever it was going to hit it was going to obliterate for sure but mm-hmm. it was just the leg and uh, it struck just below my my left knee, and uh, the rest of me fully armored. I was wearing full armor. That's the other thing. Like if you're going to be riding a motorcycle, like full armor is such a big difference. Yeah. Um, Did you have any time to react or slam on the brakes or turn at all? Just no. Straight. No, not on this one. It was just, it was so fast. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah. So I. It was just the leg that was permanently injured. I had like minor fractures in my pinky finger and pinky toe, but um, the armor saved my life because uh, if I'd had road rash in addition to all the blood loss from the leg, yeah, they wouldn't have been able to keep blood in me. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's so crazy. I cannot wait until Tesla just takes over and cars drive themselves. Cause same, especially like Porsches and like crazy like fast cars like there's not really any reason anyone needs that on the road and then you mix that with like drinking and driving it i feel like i know so many people that have done stupid things like that and like wrecked their sports car and like i don't know it's like the worst scenario you could ever put yourself in is drinking and driving and racing on the street yep yep Yep. so anyone listening just please call an uber please please call an uber yeah yeah so you were you said you were pr- like pretty fine after the accident, like aside from like your leg being messed up, like well, no head I, injuries or any of that stuff. Yeah, no, my helmet didn't have a scratch, uh, no head injury, but I very, very almost bled out. Like um, that, that part was close. They had to mm-hmm. tourniquet me and they had to airlift me like 40 minutes to Phoenix. Um, so it was, it was like down to the minute as far as surviving, but um but I did luck out very much with, you know, no permanent damage anywhere else in my body. So, yeah. So originally it was just your knee down. Yeah. They, when I woke up, they had, um, it was, it was traumatically amputated at the scene. So like, I guess hanging by like a thread, but for all intents and purposes, it was amputated by the car. And then when I got to the hospital, um, once I, once I woke up, they had, they had sewed everything back together and tried to like save the entire foot if possible, like foot, leg, everything. But it was, it was a mess. It was gnarly. They couldn't tell me how many places my foot was broken in. They just said, yeah, it's a lot. Um, and so pretty quickly, um, I knew that it wasn't going to be much use to save the foot. Um, if anything. And, um, I actually right away told them, after, after hearing about all the damage, I did say right away, like, let's just take it above the knee. Let's just get it over with. Let's get out of the hospital. I can get back to doing what I love. Um, but the compromise, they, they wanted to save the whole foot and everything. Um, but it was, 
Lim Salvage, uh, if you ever hear about limb salvage, be very, very careful because salvaging a limb for like a normal person is like, is one thing, but even, even then it's, it's like a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of surgeries. And you're lucky if you can just like walk to the bathroom afterward, like that's it. Most people yeah. just, they're like, save it at all costs. I don't want to be an amputee. I don't want to be, you know, different looking or something like that. But like your quality of life is not going to be the same. Um, and so, uh, rather than that, I was just like, you know, I know I can still fly trapeze and I can still do rings. I can do all sorts of things with one leg. So just go ahead and take off the damage part and I'll get going. The compromise was a baloney amputation, which they thought, okay, the knee might be good enough um, to save. And uh, it'd be better, obviously, to have a knee if you, if you possibly can. Um, and so, you know, I agreed to let them try to keep the knee. And we did 15 surgeries um, and tried for like a whole year. But um, for several reasons, that knee was just never going to be athletic and, uh, and was actually still infected. We, did, we didn't know that until later. Um, so I had to have my final amputation um, this last January. So okay, it's been less than a year in my current form. And how long ago was the crash? It was two Christmases ago. So just almost two years ago. So we basically spent an entire year trying to save the, the baloney amputation, but I was on crutches the whole time. I was never able to take a step in a prosthesis or anything like that. Like, yeah, I was fitted, but I couldn't ever put full weight on it. It was just not gonna, not yeah. gonna work. So do you think even with like all the technology we have nowadays that a blow amp, a blow the knee amputee is much better? Or? Yeah. If, if, if you have a good knee, yeah. it's, uh, they've said it's a difference between a 10% mobility loss and a 50% mobility loss having okay. that knee versus not. So that's why, you know, I, I was on board. If they could have saved the knee, mm -hmm. it would have been really nice to have. It would make a lot of things way easier. Um, but Again, if it's not going to be a, an athletic knee, if it's going to keep me from doing trampoline or running or, you know, any of the things that I love to do, then at that point, it's better to go above the knee and, yeah. and uh, hope for better prosthet prosthetics. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. So before before all this and even after, you're still doing flying trapeze, right? Mm -hmm. So more of a catcher or a flyer? Well, um, before... So I was never able to take a step when I had my knee, but I was actually able to make catches as a, as a flying trapeze catcher. Okay. I had just enough knee control on the left side. And I, you know what I didn't have there, I made up for on the right side. And I became the only leg amputee catcher that anybody knows of ever in the history of anything to catch somebody on the flying trapeze. But when they took my knee, I can't, uh, I can't catch yeah, in I'm my sure. current form, but I have, um, I designed and, and we've, we've tested and, and helped, uh, my prosthetists have, have helped with the design as well. Um, a prosthesis just for catching trapeze, Oh wow! which has never, ever been done before. Um, we had to just kind of figure it out on our own, but, um, that's been in development for several months now. And, um, we can already tell that it works. I just haven't, I haven't made a catch yet, but I will soon. Yeah. And, uh, we can tell that it's going to work. I just need to, um, make a couple more tweaks for it in order to fit this particular catch trap. And then, um, I need to, uh, get back in shape physically for catching. Cause it's a, it's a lot on the body. Yeah. So what would be some strength exercises that you would do for that? Um, just I, doing, just yeah. doing catcher locks. I know nothing biggest. about trapeze at all. Oh, okay. So in order to, so the catcher starts out sitting on the bar, yep. um, like a swing, Yep. I've but before that. they make a catch, they've got to do this very complicated motion called a catcher lock where they, and they're calling the timing at the same time. So they're mm -hmm. also calling the, the flyer off the board while they do this. Um, but you've got to drop down to your knees. You've got to, uh, grab the bar with your hands and then you, you pull your legs around and then you lock in, um, with the bar across your, um, like across your thighs and your, your feet around the, uh, around the cables. So just getting in and out of, out of a catch lock is a, uh, it's a very intense physical thing. Um, so 
just doing those will will help get me back in shape for that okay and so then, it's a lot of uh, lower body and like core i'm assuming it's it's probably everything arms, huh? shoulders back a lot of abs hamstrings yeah it's a hmm. lot i bet uh I, I wonder if that is good for decompression and stuff for your back it Always does seem catching to be. people you know it does seem to be because uh, uh, a lot of people go their whole life and they don't know how to decompress their back and then they end up like hunched over and stuff and like people don't realize just hanging and like doing any kind of like lat workouts and stuff that's going to pull your spine apart is really going to help decompress your back. So I bet you someone as a catcher is probably very decompressed or maybe totally the opposite. No, that's a really good point. Um I used to have a lot of lower back problems, especially from like tumbling and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And first it was flying rings that, that fixed that because yeah. that also yep. is good for decompressing. Hanging. But, um, but I've heard that from other people as well. And, and, uh, it seems, seems about right that, that trapeze catching would also be. Yeah. Yeah. Good about that. All the impacts and stuff, uh, especially when acrobats have no idea about decompressing. I'm like, Oh my God, you're crazy. Like, you need to get on a foam roller right now and like start decompressing. Yeah. Spine problems are the worst. Yeah. Spine problems are the worst and uh, they're going to affect everything. I yep. mean like even a chiropractor will tell you that I don't know if it's true or not, but the whole, your whole entire spine can pretty much fix any part of your body. I've heard been, that as well. I've been, t- I don't know if it's true or not. Like some people say that chiropractic stuff doesn't really work and I, it might not, it might not, it might not work without massage or something, but I don't, I'm not sure. I always feel good when I leave a chiropractor, though. But sometimes I'll be like, oh, yeah, my wrist hurts. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's this part of your spine. I'm like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. It is quite fascinating just how interconnected the human body is for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the spine is a crucial part, too. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things I can do with one leg. There's nothing I can do without my spine. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, I'd probably rather lose a leg than be paralyzed and not be able to do anything. That's probably worst case scenario. Totally. Th- there's been quite a few, like, pro BMX riders that have, like, head injuries, and then they're paralyzed and totally can't do anything at all. Yep. So. That was always the nightmare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely the nightmare, especially as an acrobat or something. Yep. Um. So now you're doing tramp wall, which is how I met you basically at our tramp wall competition and like seeing you at circuit center. Yeah. How long have you been doing this for? Um, I dabbled in a little bit even before the, uh, the, the accident, but I'm just, you know, playing around at like Tempest in LA and with like Taz, uh, Castaneda, um, at TSMY a little bit, trampoline and Wait, stuff. It, but who's Taz? Is that the owner? Oh no. Uh, he's a, he's a, Tramp wall artist and trapeze oh, okay. artist, stuntman, driver. I the owner's name. I think it's something short like that, though. Oh, uh, Jonathan Conan? Because he sold it, but he used mm, to. I'm not sure. One started. of them messages me on Instagram, asks for trampoline advice on like what trampolines they should buy and stuff. Oh, okay. I can't remember his name, though. All right. Well, um, but mainly uh, just the last like three, four months, I've been training with Wellington Lima, so... Yeah, no better coach to have than Wellington. So I hear. Very fortunate. Yeah, if Wellington coached me at all, I'd probably look way better on a tramp (laughs) wall. But I've not had any coaching ever, so I look like straight out of a skate park. But I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, it's your own style. Um, I mean, you're doing pullovers and stuff now, so that's pretty crazy. It took me a really long time to do a pullover. I was terrified of it. Scary for sure, but yeah, we've been working on fundamentals these last several months, and and uh, now it's really starting to pay off. Yeah. So, were you? Uh, did you do trampoline, like serious trampoline at all before? Um, I mean, I was a like I was a trampoline instructor at TSMY, but it was it was mostly pretty basic stuff. Although I did, like I learned everything in the logbook and more, and um, but it wasn't really wall focused. There was no wall there, um, mm-hmm. so I had decent tra- trampoline background but it was mostly self-taught my form wasn't that good yeah so, yeah kind of a mix i'd say uh, the only time i'd done wall was like yeah mostly at like tempest and stuff sweet so you can probably do like a branny backflip and that kind of stuff yeah yeah i used to do like double double backflips no problem or even 
two and a quarter to the back or I would do um, back foot double folds. Um, I had a quad barrel roll oh. for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> <I> <laughs> Sounds really like, like something spinning. I would try. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I love the tunnel flips. Um, so let's see. And then you're doing flying rings. You were telling me you were trying out for Volta. Yeah, I was, I was in the process. I hadn't, um, I hadn't gotten an audition, but I was seeking one and I was, uh, very, I was starting to get, um, more and more serious about that right before the accident. Um, that was my dream was to be in Volta, uh, as a flying rings artist. And I'd seen from all the videos that I'd seen, I, I could already do all of the tricks that they did. Um, I really only needed to work on my dismounts because I'd only ever dismounted over sand at yeah. Muscle Beach, but I was already doing like double flyaway dismounts over sand. So uh, I knew with with mats and foam pits and all that, I'd be able to learn the other dismounts pretty quickly. But yeah, everything that they do on the rings in the air, I did and can still do with one leg. So. Yeah, oh, well, that's pretty impressive. Um, Thanks. I mean, you're better than a lot of people who do acrobatics, and you're only using one leg right now. So. <laughs> I did get most of my training, you know, before, but still. Yeah. But so, definitely not stopping. Yeah. So how did you like living in L.A. for the last, what, decade or so? I loved it. The best thing about L.A. for me was the original Muscle Beach, like, community. Mm-hmm. Um, very quickly, they they welcomed me, and they taught me everything that I wanted to learn. And, uh, you know, it was just a, it was just a very friendly, like, like a second family basically yeah yeah especially on sundays there's so yeah, many sunday. people there yeah sunday's the big day yeah it was called it circus sundays oh nice yeah i actually hadn't ever heard that one but but yeah summer especially in the summer the sundays at uh at santa monica beach mm-hmm. was so much fun yeah i used to go there all the time i'd mostly go to the venice skate park though but i would ride up and down in santa monica that place is fun too. When I first moved to LA, I had I had some fun at the Venice Skate Park as well. But uh, I kept bailing so hard that I was like, "I'm gonna hurt myself for flying rings. I better be careful." <laughs> Were you riding a skateboard? Yeah, yeah. So I try to uh, ride scooters there, and they hate scooters there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the worst case of racism ever. Like you go there, and they're like, "Scooter, no, no, no scooters." <laughs> They'll like throw their skateboards at you and all kinds of stuff. Wow. Why the animosity do you think? Um, I think, well, I grew up with this, like, you know, being a scooter rider at the skate park, everyone always hated you and it doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's like a self-confidence issue. Cause you know, like I've met like the best skateboarders in the world and they're all like, for example, like day one song, I met him one time and he was so cool. He was like, oh, I don't care what you're doing. As long as like you're having fun and I would say the same thing, but like some people are like, I don't know, it's something different and, uh, they just, maybe they feel like it's going to take over their sport or something like that, which kind of did already. It's on the way for sure. I mean, most kids, if you go to a skate park nowadays, they're on scooters because a scooter is more fun. It's easier to pick up. That. That's cool. Like, uh, for example, if you ride a scooter for a month, you can ride around the whole skate park pretty easily, cover all of the ramps, maybe do some 360s, flips pretty easily. And then on a skateboard, you could spend like four years doing it and still not be able to do all of that stuff and not hit all the gaps and stuff. So scooter is just like, it's the most efficient. It's close to a bike. You can do all the same stuff, but you don't have this big like lung of a thing under you. I think that's the problem with BMX is it's so heavy, so it kind of limits you a little bit. But you see nowadays, like, most of the best scooter riders turn into BMX riders, and then it just translates over all the tricks. That's cool. Yeah. Quicker access to the fun part, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's just a... Yeah, exactly. Like, when you go to a skate park, you see all these big ramps. You want to ride all those big ramps. And on a skateboard, you're kind of limited to, like, stair sets and stuff until you get really good, and it takes... I just didn't have the patience for skateboarding, so I was a rollerblader, and then I eventually started scootering. Very nice. Yeah. So you were doing photography Mm -hmm. um, professionally? Yes. Okay, so what kind of stuff did you shoot? Oh, man, all sorts. Um, Did a lot of uh, landscape, architecture, events, portraits, um, but kind of just anything. My, My policy was like, if it comes up, and it seems fun, I do it. 
you know, and uh, until it gets tedious or, or at least, you know, at least give it a shot, basically. But shot resorts for a travel company. They send mm-hmm. me all over the place. I oh, that sounds fun. Really fun events. Um, just I got, uh, you know, better and better clients, reputation, all of that. And then I really didn't have to advertise or anything like that. It was all word of mouth. And um, and again, yeah, just said yes to whatever came up. I shot cookbooks. I shot, um, you know, magazine stuff like fine art prints, like a lot of different things. Yeah. yeah. And photography is a hard business to get into, especially in L.A. where it's super competitive. Definitely. But that was the that was kind of the personal challenge for myself. It was like, all right, you know, and I went to school for photography. So I was like, all right, well. You know, I feel like I can make a career out of this, but, and I'm willing to put in the work, but, you know, I don't know how hard it's going to be. So I just kind of jumped into the deep end and, and, uh, trial by fire kind of situation, but yeah, it worked out. So you went to school for it? I did. Yeah. In Georgia, um, I have a degree in journalism, uh, but I specialized in photojournalism. Oh, okay. I went for, uh, photography as well when I first went, but it was like, film photography and like all that stuff and I was like wait I already have like a DSLR and like I just (laughs) then like finally we got to DSLR portion and spent like a week on how to upload footage and I was like I'm so far ahead of this I gotta get out of here oh man yeah like I already had a YouTube channel and stuff so I was like I kind of already know what I'm doing a little bit but uh didn't really do much I like videography much more I actually did some of that as well. Um, I did. I shot a lot of video with my DSLRs, but yeah. Yeah, because for me, I just wanted to film skate park stuff, and that was about it. Like, even nowadays, if like a model wants me to photograph them or something, I'm like, I don't know how you should stand, but (laughs) smile. (laughs) Terrible at like the model photography kind of stuff. So you eventually started to come to Vegas quite a bit, right? Yeah, um, it was really the pandemic because um, for the most part, I, you know, I was happy just doing rings and, and whatever I could um, down in L.A. Um, and doing trapeze and stuff. But uh, when the pandemic hit, everything was closed and my beach, we couldn't even, you know, They go. closed the beach, huh? They closed the beach. They took down the equipment. Um, they took it down? For a while, yeah. Oh, they damn. finally put it back up like a week or two ago, but it's still like... Well, now they probably caution taped it or something. They caution taped it and everybody was still going and it was this big, there was all this politics and it seemed like everybody was so divided. They were like, they're either like, stay in your home. I can't believe you would even leave your apartment. Like, what are you doing at the beach? Eat your mashed potatoes by yourself. Or they were on the whole other end of the spectrum. Like, oh, the scientists don't really know what they're doing. Like, oh, it's a big conspiracy or I'm just going to use positive vibes to ward off the whatever. Like... It was like it was one way or the other, and uh, and I was trying to like take a more sensible like middle road approach. Like, okay, let's be as careful as possible, but also like you know, get you would a think that's exercise. the most like sensible thing to do. But for some so. reason, our world is just split down the middle. It's yeah. one side or the other. Yeah. So it's like instead you get flack from both sides. It's like, why are you wearing a mask? Why are you being so cautious? I'm like. Yeah, I'm just trying to trying to be a responsible citizen, but then the the whole other side is like, why are you even out of your apartment? It's like, oh my god. Yeah, yeah, I lost some friends when the pandemic hit, and we decided to go on a camping trip. And we're like, got all these messages from people like, I can't believe you're not following the rules. I'm like, we're so far away from anyone. Like, what are we doing wrong? Like, <laughs> using my brain <laughs> for the nature. You know, still listening to science but doing you know yeah. the most responsible thing that i can and preserving sanity yeah yeah you have to preserve sanity and I, like i feel like this is going to take a huge toll on like the kids growing yeah. up now that are like not in school now everything's on an ipad you're learning on zoom nowadays like yep this generation is going to grow up to be i don't know it's going to be weird it's going to be gonna, a challenge for sure yeah, social media is uh, can be good for some things, but not when you grow. I don't think it's good when you grow up on social media. Like for me, I was already probably seventeen years old or so when like MySpace started becoming big. So it was like I already lived most of my life and already developed all these like uh, hands-on skills and people skills, and 
other kids are going to grow up really awkward and they're not going to be able to, it's going to be like, uh oh, I have to meet him in person. Yep. That's going to be a weird one. Yep. So you are moving to Vegas now? So um, I just bought a house here in Vegas, but um, I'm going to be back and forth. I'm, LA, I think, is always going to be my home, mm-hmm. but um, but the last three, four months, I've spent a lot more time in Vegas than I have been in LA. Um, so I'm kind of nomadic, plan to stay that way. I'll be yeah. traveling a lot, but it'll be nice to have some roots here in Vegas so that I can train whenever whenever, uh, whenever I want, whenever I'm in town. Yeah, I feel you. I grew up in LA, and uh, I never, ever thought I would move away from LA. I was like, there's no way I'd move away from the mountains and the beach. Yeah, normally they have everything there. But, yeah. uh, man, during this pandemic, everything's like, everything that I love about L.A. is like yep. off limits now. Yeah, so. I was there last week, and I've been going up and back every week for the last couple months. And, like, I saw the all of the, the tracks where people walk on have, like, caution tape around them. You're not allowed to go on them, and, like, the fields are open still. I'm like, what? Like, for one, did we completely forget about recycling and, like, taking care of the earth? Because now we're just throwing plastic everywhere. And, like, that kind of doesn't make sense. Like, why are we really keeping people off of tracks? If they want to exercise, you should be able to exercise, I think. I don't know. Seems like a lot of people trying to tell you what you can and can't do nowadays. We're all just still trying to figure out how to be in this new world, I think. So it's just, it's going to be... Two steps forward, mm-hmm. one step back, I'm sure, for a while. Yeah, we were watching uh, live UFC events the other day, and I was like, oh, my God, that looks so amazing. Like, crowds of people, and, like, before it, this whole came around, it looks like it's almost like a different a different world, you know? It kind of is, but... Yeah. So you're getting kind of into real estate now, right? You just bought a house. Yeah. Um, looking into more investment properties down the road. I want to get better about, you know navigating that whole realm uh, yeah it could be fun so yeah i tried to get into that stuff a bit uh it's it's like a whole different game though like you have to know so many different ins and outs of like finances and what you want to look for in a house and there's it's like a whole different like genre of things that i've never even like i listened to like two audiobooks and i felt like i knew what i was getting into and then like i looked at a few houses and was like uh, probably should like read some more books before I like start buying stuff. Oh man, yeah. yeah. I have a a bit of an advantage, I guess, because my my dad was oh, in construction my whole life. Um, we renovated several houses together, and and currently he uh, is a a home inspector um, as his as his profession. So I've gotten a lot of really good advice from him, and then I also have um, several good like realtor friends and kind of like a basically a team. Um, that I rely on for, for their expertise. Um, so it's not just me. I don't feel like overwhelmed, like I have to know everything, but more like I find the right people that, that know what they need to know. And, and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll work again. We've only, only done one so far, but yeah. yeah. And there's a, there's a lot of benefits of owning many houses as well. Like I was just talking to my tax person yesterday and like we were going over the loopholes and all that kind of stuff that you have in real estate and like that's the business to be in really like if you can own 10 houses or something you really don't have to work again yep unless a pandemic hits or something like that would never happen though (laughs) right yeah (laughs) and everyone's like i don't want to pay rent anymore (laughs) oh man yeah seriously yeah um so then now like the last topic is kind of you've been working with people on prosthetics and like new uh, technology for prosthetics, correct? Yeah. And I want to do that more and more as well. Um, I'd really like to help be on the forefront of, of the, the next generation tech. Um, so that's why I'm, that's one of the big reasons that I'm training so hard right now is because I want to, um, I want to, be the best platform that I can be for testing, for showcasing mm-hmm. new tech, for, um, you know, helping to design, helping to tweak, you know, whatever. So I want to be in the best shape that I possibly can. And I want personally, my mission is like, I want to help make prosthesis that can do, 
we've gotten really good at, at, at things that can help you walk and do normal human activities or, or even running like in the Paralympics, sprinting, running all that in a straight line. But we don't have, um, just, there's not, you know, amputee gymnasts. There's not, you not know, yet. acrobatics. Yeah, exactly. And if you can do acrobatics on a leg, then you can do almost anything that's yeah, that for opens sure. up, you know, that it will translate to usable, um, movement and features for for everyone else as well but it'll be especially nice just just knowing that a whole slew of new things are possible on the new you know the next generation legs things like that yeah, legs feet all that yeah definitely acrobatics is taking it to a different level like setting the bar really high yeah yeah sweet um well thanks for coming on and telling your story and all that stuff Sure. Really appreciate it. Uh, where can everyone find you on social media? So on Instagram, I'm ab, uh, amputee acrobat. Yep. Uh, all one word. That's a good name. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and on Facebook, it's just my name, Charles Ryan. It's a hyphen. So Charles Ryan, double name, and then last name Barber. Sweet. Um, on Facebook. And um, yeah, I'm pretty like public, easy to find. <laughs> so Sweet. All right. And thank you, everyone, for listening, viewing. Thanks. Uh, subscribe if you guys haven't, and we will see you guys in the next one. Peace. Thanks again.